may be seated. Good to see you this morning. Glad you're here. You have been prayed for today, and you're not here by accident today. That song that we just sang has been sung in various forms, really since the dawn of creation. Great is thy faithfulness, O Lord Almighty. It's a song of pilgrims going to Jerusalem. It's a song of Abraham and Sarah waiting for the promise. It's a song of the church through centuries. You have not failed me yet. And that's not a line of doubt, but saying, God, I trust you now. It's a song of faith, in particular, when it's difficult. I had a conversation with someone last week that was struggling, struggling with life itself, wanting to be home with Christ. And in that conversation... I said, your story's not done yet. Your story is not done. All of our stories are not done. And the truth is, if you're a Christian, your story ends with, and they live happily ever after. It's something to clap upon. That's why we sing Hosanna. This is what we see in Revelation. We'll talk about that more today. But your story's not over yet. Sing that song, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness. When it's good, amen. It's easy. When it's hard, that's actually more important to sing it now. Great is Thy Faithfulness. So remember that song and the various versions of it that's been sung for ages. It's helpful. It's hopeful. It's encouraging. So thank you for leading us, guys. Appreciate that very much. And at this time, we're going to dismiss the kids. Thanks, kids. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you for coming early. Lots of them are gone and others are going. We have a very active basement down there and so grateful that we have so many kids. <laughs> and uh, we have a very active congregation. Uh, if you were able to help celebrate with our Myanmar congregation that meets at 1 o'clock every week, there was like 250 people here last Sunday afternoon, and it was a riot. It was a good time. And so we congratulate them. So grateful that the Lord has put us together. There's a lot of um, multinational things that are happening as well, even just thinking this past weekend. We had a men's breakfast in the morning, and then the afternoon there was a baby shower, and then in the evening there was a Congolese engagement party. And they were having a good time, let me tell you, right? So that took place, and uh, it's been a, been a good, good weekend. Also, if you have not heard, on a more serious and somber note, uh, Jack Young went to go and be with the Lord this last week. Uh, the funeral is this afternoon at 2 o'clock. The information is, of course, on, on the Internet. And so Jack was a long, long-time member of Temple Baptist and um, I was told that almost every surface in this place was painted by him. And they supplied lots of material because they owned a true value hardware store. They participated in lots of different trips. And the woodworking that you'll see, like the common ground stuff and all of these woodworking things around the building, was Jack. And so uh, we, you know, if you think about praying for LMA, of course, and the three kids and all the grandkids... But uh, we want to honor him, and that funeral again is today at 2 o'clock. Okay, so today we are looking now at our last installment of our series in the life of Abraham. And so you're going to need a Bible, but you're going to go to a different place than you anticipate. And so we have been walking 14 weeks in the life of Abram, which is Abraham, and Sarai, which is Sarah, starting in Genesis chapter 12, all the way to Genesis chapter 24. My hope is that this series is and has been encouraging to you, giving you perspective from their walk to your walk and my walk. As we saw that God called them out with amazing promises, 
promises of blessing, promises of protection, promises of them being a blessing to all of the nations with a promised son. There was interactions, and there was wanderings, and there was followings, there was great steps of faith, and there were missteps, and there was tests, and there was reaping of what they'd sown. Their life, in some ways, is parallel with our lives. As God calls to us, calls us to himself, calls us to walk with him, and we walk with him in faith, holding to the promises that are written for us in Scripture. Having the Holy Spirit come in, sealing us, changing us, transforming us, leading us as we follow Christ as His representatives here on the earth. So today we're going to look at the rest of the story of their lives. And our overarching theme for this entire series is this. Trust God's promises by living a life of faith. Trusting is like one wing of an airplane. You have to have that wing. But if you only have one wing, you're not going to get off the ground. It first starts with trusting God and who Christ is and the promises that he has given to us written in his word. That's a wing. And with that wing, we couple it with by living a life of faith. So believing is something that we do internally. It goes beyond knowing because you and I know a lot of things, but we shouldn't believe everything, right? Right? So it's, we first have to know, and then we choose what we're going to believe. And this is what we put in the treasure trove of our heart. This is what we believe. It's an internal orientation of what we believe is true. Our values and the foundation stone of our life is stored in the recess of our heart, so to speak. And then from that place, we now live out what we believe. Sometimes, again, we do it excellently, and other times we <laughs> fail, but continue to get up and keep moving. So if you are a believer, which most of us in this room are, Continue to remind yourself of the promises of God, putting it into your heart and my heart. And then ask God, how, God, can I best live this truth out in this world as you have called me to follow you and represent you as salt and as light in our generation before you and I finally go home. Right? This is our great task. This is our great calling. And God has given to us his plan in the story of the Bible. And I've talked about this and I want you to remind yourself that the Bible is one big story with so many events that are in it from Creation, and we have these things up here all the way to restoration. And if you know the Bible, it opens up in the beginning, God, right? God created this paradise that was here, creation, and all of its wonder. And then the villain shows up in the form of a snake, right? Tricking, trapping, and our first human parents fell away. The fall comes in early in the story of the Bible. And then as it continues through Genesis, we see God interacting with his creation, with Cain and Abel and up to Noah and the flood and onto the Tower of Babel and into this calling of this man named Abram. We read his story and his descendants and how they continue going through Genesis. 
It continues as they go into Egypt, and God calls them out, and we see a guy named Moses. And we read about him in Exodus and Genesis in the first five books of the Bible and throughout the Bible. And then Joshua leads the people into the land that was promised 430 years previously. And you see those folks doing well as prophets of God, Samuel and others, show up and there's struggles there. And sometimes good, sometimes poor. And they choose a king named Saul, and he does not do well, but God chooses a king named David, reassuring his promises to him. And we read about these things in First and Second Chronicles and First and Second Kings. We read this in the Bible. And then we see this interaction, and this interaction where God sends prophets, and we have major prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel. We have then minor prophets that are there like Joel and Amos and Hezekiah and these folks. We see the prayers of those Old Testament people in the book of Psalms. And we read about the wisdom and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes in the book of Job. And it's all there for us in this redemption process. And then there was silence. For 400 long years until there was a man named John the Baptist when the time was right came to prepare the way of the Lord and just the right time the promised son the true son of promise named Jesus came into the world and we sing joy to the world the Lord has come and we see the interaction in this story in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And the church continues to go forward. And we read about it in the book of Acts. And then one of the apostles goes and goes and makes missionary journeys. And we have these books like First and Second Corinthians and Colossians and Galatians and Philippians. These letters in the New Testament. And we have apostles like John writing to the church and Jude and Philemon, and then at the very end, this book called Revelation, where God lays out as in what is yet to come and some things that have taken place, and we see the very end of the story. It says, I will be coming soon. The story of the Bible, don't miss it, creation and fall and redemption and in the very end there is restoration with every Christian story ends again with they lived happily ever after. That's the story of Christianity, of God and his people. And we don't even know what that end really looks like. But I want you to know, how, however dark it is and difficult, and some of you are going through difficulties that are excruciating, painful, debilitating, heart-wrenching. Your story is not over yet. Remember this. God, give me strength to continue. And this is why we renew our mind. This is why we read this word. This is why we gather in community. This is why God's given us prayer and he interacts with us. This is why we have the Holy Spirit in our lives. This is why God continues to work until his plan has been complete. This is the grand story of God and his creation, and you are a part of it. I am a part of it. We are a part of it. It's beautiful. It's grand. It's powerful. And there are dangers, and there are struggles, and there are trials, and there are temptations, just like all of the stories that we love it is because it is the grand story that God is telling. It's a beautiful thing, and I don't want you to lose your place in it. 
And so we have traveled again with Abraham and with Sarah and with their sons and all of these things. And so the rest of the story goes like this. In Genesis chapter 23, Sarah dies at 127 years old. Abraham, her husband, buys a piece of land there because they were living in tents. They didn't own any land. They wanted a permanent place of burial. He buys this place in Hebron, and she is buried there. And you can read this, Genesis 23. Genesis chapter 24, Abraham secures a wife for this son, Isaac. And it is a beautiful story of God's sovereignty and provision. Abraham later on, and perhaps some of you don't know this, he did marry again to another lady called Keturah. And they have other children. And you can read this in Genesis chapter 25, verses 1 through 6. And then Abraham himself dies at a ripe old age of 175. <laughs> Could you imagine living that long? <laughs> Would you want to live that long? Some of you guys are like, yeah, take me home, Lord Jesus, right? <laughs> 175 years old. Incredible. <laughs> he is buried, buried alongside his wife, Sarah, in Hebron. And this is Genesis 25, 7 through 10. Isaac and, guess who else buries them? Ishmael. And there's a story there. Bury their father, Abraham. We have Abraham. God promised to him, seen in the life of Isaac, which was his son, Isaac, has another son named Jacob, the one who wrestled with God. And read it, continue to read this book. His name was eventually turned, changed to, does anyone know what his name was changed to? Israel. Israel had the 12 sons, which became the 12 tribes, and on it goes. One of my favorite chapters of all of Scripture is chapter 11 of Hebrews, and this is where I'm going. So go ahead, if you have a Bible with you, Hebrews chapter 11, starting with verse 8. This chapter is called uh, the Hall of Faith. As the writer of Hebrews goes back and details in short order, quick fashion, the lives of people from the Old Testament. It is a powerful chapter. And as he goes through, we learn things, we see things, and there's some amazing statements. If you ever need some encouragement to continue to go forward, read Hebrews chapter 11 and then spill into chapter 12 where it talks about Christ who the joy set before him endured the cross, fixing, fix our eyes on Jesus. Read it. In this listing of these characters, people from the Old Testament, of course, there are some verses about Abraham, and also Sarah. And so we're going to look at these verses today to answer the question of what it means to live a life of faith. And there's a summary of what this means. And we're going to see three things, very practical things, things that I want you to consider to meditate on, to pray about, and then live in your life. There is a tremendous, important summation of their life that we've been spending 14 weeks unpacking. So here we are, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8, and this is what it says. 
by faith. And you'll see that, by the way, all over this chapter. You can just go ahead and highlight or circle in this entire chapter all of these places. By faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith. So by faith, our man Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later okay, receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went. Even though he did not know where he was going. Let's stop there. And here is our first major point. Living a life of faith means obeying your calling. First, when God calls us, we are called to Jesus. Don't miss that. God doesn't ask us or call us to do things for him or with him on our own account. He first calls us to himself. Remember when Jesus was on the scene? As he was teaching, as he was preaching, as he was traveling, what did he tell people? Go and proclaim things for me? He didn't say that. What did he say? Come and follow me. Your first calling is to follow Jesus. Hear that. Someone needs to write that down. Your first calling is to follow Christ. To know him. What are you like? What is your heart? How do you respond and interact? Know Christ first and foremost. Get to know him. We are first called to Jesus and second, we are called through Jesus to represent him in this time and in this earth. Called to Jesus and called through Jesus to follow him, to represent him, and most importantly, to become like him. I don't know about you, but times in my life I have wondered about God's calling on my life. By the way, if you're called by God, and here's the deal, you're all called by God, right? Every one of you. Now that does not necessarily mean that you're going to be up here as a pastor, it might mean that, but God's calling is for everyone, everywhere. There's generalities we know, and then there are some specifics. But you and I are called and gifted to represent Him. And so in figuring out these calls, I like to say this to folks in saying that your form determines your function. Your form, how you're created, determines how you function. Now, where do I get that from? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, and I've quoted it many times in this place. After we're called by grace for salvation, that's Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. And then verse 10 tells us some very interesting things. You are God's workmanship or masterpiece. Just let that sink in. Right? You say, well, God's got a pretty flawed masterpiece. God is continuing to make us all into the image of the Son. You are God's workmanship masterpiece. Some of you are saying, well, I don't believe that. 
God said it, not a pastor or preacher. God says this. The implications are deep. You are, I am, we are God's workmanship, masterpiece created, how? In Christ Jesus. For what? To do good works which he has prepared in advance for us. So in order to understand how we are to function during our time on this planet, in this place, the external application is a direct result of an internal transformation or internal creation. So if you're wondering, God, how can I best know you and represent you? I want you to first understand who you are, your likes your callings, your giftedness, form, determines, functions, and then couple with who and how you are created with the opportunities that God has given you, and then move in those things. Did this make sense? Okay. Understand this. Second, know that your gifts and your call are irrevocable. God doesn't call you to something and says, well, sorry, that was a mistake. You're clearly not qualified. I was having a bad day. Right? <laughs> Does not happen. He will call you to something, and that could be a wide variety of things. He has gifted you. And by the way, you know that you are gifted. You know that? It's not egotistical. You're gifted. And when God gives you a calling, and when he gives you a gift, he's not taking them back. However, he's going to ask us for an account of them. Do you know that? So God, how can I take what you have given as a steward, as one who has been given things that are for us, but they're not about us, And use those things in service to him in this world. Abraham was called and he obeyed and went. You can steer something that is moving, so start moving forward. You're not going to know it all, right? I don't know what's even going to happen this afternoon. I don't surely know what's going to happen 10 years from now. But I want to be moving and following Christ because Christ is always on the move. Move. Direct me. Shape me. Steer me. Abraham didn't know. He knew enough. And you know enough to get moving. Walk. Go. Follow. Living a life of faith means obeying your calling. Not my calling. Your calling and 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 your calling. And your calling. Living a life of faith means obeying your calling. We saw that clearly. In Abraham, in Sarai, again, we saw lots of things. And Jesus even said this, by the way. He says, if you love me, you will memorize my words. If you love me, you will go to church faithfully. If you love me, you will have a really sweet fish bumper sticker on the back of your car. a really nice cross point cup, right? Did he, is that what he said? Excuse me, this is disgusting, so here we go. He didn't say that. <laughs> he said, if you love me, you will yeah, obey. Obey. Isn't it interesting how love and obedience go together? 
God's love language is obedience. He also said, well, we say, Lord, Lord, and we don't follow him. The question is, do we love him if we're not obeying him? Obedience to Christ is not optional for those who love Christ. Let that just sink in. It's not a heavy thing like, oh, I'm obligated. It's no, I, it's not I have to, but I get to. There's a difference. I get to do this. I get to know you versus, oh, I have to do this. <laughs> there are times that there's that struggle. I get you. But God, yes, I'll follow you in that. So the first thing we see in summation about Abraham in Hebrews chapter 11, living a life of faith means obeying your calling. So get after it. You have to talk to God about this. And then engage, however that looks. Living a life of faith, and we are all called as Christians, to live a life of faith, believing God, then obey your calling. Well, it's hard. Well, what did you expect? Believe me, it will be worth it in the end. So we read in the next verse, as we come to our next point, this is what it says in verse 9 of Hebrews 11. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. Now, he lived in tents, as did Isaac, his son, and Jacob, his grandson, who were heirs with him of the same promise. Here's the next point. Living a life of faith means living like a stranger. And some of us are stranger than others. <laughs> Not being strange, <laughs> but being living like a stranger, a foreigner, someone coming from somewhere else. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means that your identity, your values, how you think, what you and I do, our actions and our activities come from our family of faith. That we get these things not from the society or the culture that we are currently living, but from a different society, a different culture, in our sense, a heavenly one. We are called this by the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. Underline that. As though God were making his appeal through us. You know how ambassadors function or diplomats function? Say you were called by our government to represent the United States... Let's pick a country. How about Russia? <laughs> so if you and I were called to be a diplomat from the United States in a foreign country, what that means is that what we say, we get from the authority from the United States of America. And we represent America in the place that were called in our illustration, Russia. What it also means that the embassy in Russia and whatever foreign country is out there, that land, by the way, is 
United States land. You know that? And by the way, where the diplomat or ambassador walks is considered the United States. Not permanently, but while they're there occupying that square foot of ground, that's considered the United States. Now, if we put it to our Christian context, the Holy Spirit, God himself, calls you an ambassador. Guess where you are, or what and where you are representing. You are representing Christ and you are representing the kingdom of heaven. So that means that we are, we are here even in the United States. We're foreigners because we're representing a better king and a better president. His name is Jesus. That means when you step into work Monday, you're working at wherever you work or wherever you go to school, but you're representing the King of Kings as an ambassador. Our collective primary calling is to represent Christ as ambassadors as though God was making his appeal through us. What you say matters. How you live matters because you're representing the kingdom of God. We are called to be in the world but not of the world. In the world, yes, and sometimes Christians get that wrong where we try to cloister ourselves and we make the church into a fortress. Close the doors, close the windows. Let's be scared of anybody and everybody out there. And there are churches who do this cloister themselves away and pray until Jesus comes. We are not called to be a fortress. We're called to be a force. I'm glad somebody got that. You got it. Hear me. Dark, excuse me, light does not run from darkness. Darkness runs from light. Are there things that are dangerous? Absolutely. There's this phrase that's saying, well, being at the center of God is the safest place in the world. That's not true. Being in the center of God's will... <laughs> Sometimes it's super dangerous. Try talking to my pastor friends in Ukraine. We're staying. Never said God's will will be free of difficulties and dangers because the opposite actually is more likely. Live like a stranger, knowing that we don't represent this world. So that means, and we're told not to be conformed to the pattern of this world, but to be what? Transformed how? Renewing of your mind. <laughs> How does that happen? One of, the, one of the reasons why we come to church is to focus our eyes on what's true eternally. One of the reasons why we read scripture over and over and over and over and over and over and over again to renew and remember, put back into our mind that we would think like our Savior. It's important. And we're called to make a difference. To make a difference, we have to be different. Which means the value systems of our culture, in American culture, what do most Americans value? Money. Is that, is that not accurate? More. More. We just value actually more. More money, 
more square foot, more and better cars, better appearances. Oh, Lord. Is that the value of heaven? What's the value of heaven? Faith, hope, and love. Sounds about right. Oh, and loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Anyone heard that before? And loving your who? Even your cranky neighbor? All the neighbors. <clears throat> to make a difference, we have to be different. God, work in us. Help us to value things differently. When we gather together, this should be a place that represents the kingdom of God. Where we love each other in this place, regardless of what we look like. Regardless if we walked here or we came in a private jet, regardless if we have lots of letters and PhDs behind our name, or we hardly know how to spell our name. Kingdom of God, we embrace each other, we love each other. That's what I love about this place. People tell me, you are a pecu peculiar people. I said, yes, we are. You have people of different nationalities and languages and ages and places. Yeah, isn't it beautiful? I think God likes that. Second point, live a life. Living a life of faith means living like a stranger. We live in America, but we represent heaven. I'm grateful for America, but America has its issues too. Representing a better place. Verse 10, next point. Summation of Abraham's life. For he, Abraham, was what? was looking forward to the city with foundations, plural. Whose? Architects. And builder is God. Third point, living a f life of faith means Looking forward to capital T, the capital C city. Looking forward to a place that is permanent. A place that is not constructed by man, that is perishable, that is corruptible, but built by God himself that is eternal, that is glorious, that is incorruptible. The place where our hearts long. We know in our hearts that this world is sick. How we interact with one another and the despicable things that people do to one another. How we destroy God's good creation. How we twist and pervert our relationship with the good creator, this place 
is sick and our hearts long for something more. Do you feel that? I feel that when I attend another funeral. I feel that when we pray for someone in the hospital with cancer has come back. I feel that when children are born with debilitating defects. Feel it not the way it was intending and it puts in our heart a longing for a different city. Right. This world is not your true home, by the way. We are just a passing through. And don't get overly attached to this world. How foolish would it be if you went away and you had a hotel room and you decided you didn't like the decor and so you got new furniture and bought a new bed and got a bigger TV and painted the walls and then you checked out to go to another hotel. No one does that. Why? Because they're not there permanently and they don't ultimately own it. Live like that. It's okay. I'm just passing through anyway. Here to make a difference. Don't back into heaven. <laughs> Longing for what you're leaving. No one backs into heaven. Your best days are yet to come. I'm just getting older. I'm not talking about then. I'm talking about then. <laughs> Your best days are yet to come. We look forward. Remember? <laughs> Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of his faith. Through the joy set before him, he looked forward. He endured the cross, gave him strength for the day. So looking forward towards the city will give you hope for today. Your story's not over. The end isn't yet, but it is promised, so therefore great is thy faithfulness. Oh God Almighty. Scripture tells us this over and over again. We're like grass, we're like flowers, we're here for a short time. Abraham looked forward to a city with foundations. This city is described, by the way, at the end of the book. This is put in at the very beginning, in the beginning of the book of Genesis, and we read about it at the end. Revelation 21, and he carried me away. This was the apostle John, who, by the way, was alone on an island by himself because of his witness for Christ. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great mountain that was high and showed me the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like jasper, clear as crystal. And it had a great high wall with 12 gates and with 12 angels at the gates. And on the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, three on the west. The wall of the city had 12 foundations. Here it is. This is the city, Abraham. 
This is where he was longing for. And on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. A city with foundations and gates. The foundation is on the gospel that was proclaimed by the apostle. You enter through being a part of the family of God. Through a gate, part of the family, we enter this place, this glorious, celestial, heavenly city that is yet to come. Jesus being the chief cornerstone. This is where your and my and they lived happily ever after happens. And we cannot even comprehend what comes next. That's where Abraham was longing for. That is the place that every person listed in Hebrews chapter 11 is longing for. And my hope is that's the same place you are longing for as well. But now we are here as ambassadors, but hang on and look forward to the city. So no matter how hard it gets here, and it will, and it has been hard at times, excruciating, it's not over. If you want hope for the future, use the long lens. <laughs> Stop looking through the microscope. Start looking through the telescope. Ah, I know where I'm going. It's okay. That helps. Revelation 7, 9, I'm going to end with this passage. After this I looked, and there before me was a hmm, great multitude. Do you remember a great multitude be promised to someone? Abraham? That's the multitude. There before me was a great multitude that no one could count. Remember that from Abraham? Hey, Abraham, look up to the stars. Your descendants are going to be that Numerous. Hey, 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 Abraham, look to the sand of the desert. Your descendants will be that numerous. Abraham, you are and will be and through you a blessing to all the nations of the world and from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing there before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding, what is it? Palm branches. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. You remember that? Lamb, substitutionary atonement, Abraham, this is the final home. Palm branches, by the way, in the New Testament are only listed two times. One in the Gospels, victory, peace, triumph, everlasting life. Foreshadow when Jesus came the first time, it's going to be, the reality is going to be when he comes the second time. It's not going to be kids holding on to these things. It's going to be all y'all. I do like that. That was a foreshadow of what is yet to come. Abraham had a foreshadow of what was yet to come. 
Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Conclusion. Fourteen weeks in Abraham. Some of you will never hear a series about Abraham again in your life. I'm just telling you the truth. That's the truth. Get your notes. <laughs> Take a look. Remember. And when you read it again, read it again. Read it again. Remember. For today, remember this. Trust God's promises by living a life of faith. Let's go. Do so how? How? Obey your calling. How? By living like a stranger. How? By looking forward to a city with foundations. Who will help. Whose architect and builder is God. In your journey of faith, remember the life of Abraham and Sarah. Take hope. Be encouraged. Gain strength to continue to persevere in the tents we now live in. Hold on to hope. And Abraham and Sarah serve as a profound model of faith. Not because they were perfect, but because they were persistent. Persist until you hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. Next week, this upcoming week on Friday, we celebrate and observe. No, celebrate's not the right word. We observe Good Friday. Then, of course, we focus on Easter and the hallmark, the cornerstone, the resurrection of Christ. Hope to see you to celebrate together. So let's pray. God, what a joy and privilege it is for us to walk through these things written for us in Genesis about Father Abraham. What a privilege it is, God, to be here, to embrace one another, to embrace you, to sing praises to you, to have a place for kids and for families and for all sorts of people. God, what a privilege. Thank you that in our less than perfect way, There's a touch of heaven here. Great is your faithfulness, God. Great is your faithfulness. You have not failed us, and nor will you ever. So God, help us to persevere. Help us to hold on to hope. Help us to praise you in the midst of unanswered questions, unfulfilled hopes, and gratitude and grace for all of your goodness to us. May you be praised, God. Build your kingdom here. Glorify yourself in this place, and we say, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Until we raise our palm branches on that day in your glorious city, we stand in faith, Hosanna, and we praise you. Thank you for your goodness to us. In Jesus' name, amen.